the pollinators are just going nuts. Nature lovers, Bob Ellis here with another episode of Notes from the Field. And hey, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, why don't you do that right now? Today we're out here in Skull Valley, Arizona on the Lavender Farm, right out in the middle of the beautiful Muggy and Highlands ecoregion. I ran into the Lavender Farm's owner, Will Duncan, last week at the farmer's market and he said, Bob, you got to come out. The pollinators are going off. And so Jenny Tutone, our program director, saw this as a perfect opportunity to delve into our new video series called Unlocking Nature's Hidden Relationships. This series of five videos is going to explore interspecific relationships between organisms. Interspecific just simply means between two different species, two or more different species. And so these five videos are gonna focus on predation, competition, commensalism, parasitism, and today, mutualism. Mutualism is a relationship between two organisms where the organisms seem to benefit one another. So quite frequently, there's a misunderstanding of the difference between symbiosis and mutualism. Symbiosis in the world of ecology means a close relationship between two or more organisms. Mutualism is a little different, and you might think of mutualism as a type of symbiosis, because in mutualism, it's a relationship where both species benefit. Got it! What I've caught here is a Sonoran bumblebee, Bombus sonoris. So bumblebees are adorable hairy bees. And these hairs keep it insulated for the colder months. So they're actually the first ones to arrive out of their hive and then the last ones to go back. So let's go over some quick ID tips for the Sonoran bumblebee and compare it to other bumblebees. So on its thorax, that's one of the upper sections of its body, it has a black band through the middle and separated by yellow towards the head and yellow towards the bottom. There's a similar species, the American bumblebee, and it has yellow towards the top and black on the bottom, so it's missing that distinct black band. So another really cool thing about bumblebees is that they collect pollen and nectar with a pollen basket. So this is on their hind legs, kind of a shiny, smooth area, without some hairs, and it's able to stick nectar and pollen to take it back to its hive. And yes, I did say hive. These bumblebees are actually social bees. So if you don't know, most of our native bees are solitary bees. They don't nest in a social group. But bumblebees, they have one reproductive queen in a hive. So they're gonna go back and bring pollen and nectar to that queen. So if they have a hive, why don't we collect its honey then, like we do with honeybees? So this is because they use up all of that pollen and nectar to feed their young. They're feeding the next generation of queens because bumblebees, they die after a year. Honeybees do not. Honeybees need to sustain themselves to, through the winter so they preserve all of that nectar. So that's how we're able to gather honey from honeybees. But we don't do that with bumblebees. So the interesting thing about mutualisms, it kind of depends on how you think about what a mutualistic relationship is. One thing I'd like for you to remember is that Bees evolved roughly 100 million years ago. At least they show up in the fossil record mid-Cretaceous, about 100 million years ago. And so bees 
have been collecting pollen for a hundred million years and the interaction between the species that is collecting the pollen and those producing the pollen is once again fascinating because wait pollen is what the flowers use to reproduce so keeping pollen around would seem important so in some ways it seems like well, maybe the, the bees are preying on the pollen. But the other side of this is that the plants are relying on the bees to take that pollen and spread it to other flowers. And there you have sexual reproduction, which enhances the reproductive success of all the organisms over time. And so maybe you could think about mutualism as balanced, mutual, exploitation because the bee is exploiting the pollen uh, or exploiting the flower via the pollen because it's collecting it for its young and the flower is exploiting the bee to do the pollinator work. These queens are ridiculous. Whoa look I think yeah funeral dusky wing Look at this funeral dusky wing. It's a skipper and its markings are very similar to a mourning cloak. I think they get their name from the somber clothing that people wore at funerals. It's a beautiful skipper and it's tied to Fabaceae, the beans. And there's a locust tree conveniently close by here. Look, 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 an orange skipperling. Oh! See that little fella? It's so tiny. And skippers, many skippers are tied to grasses. And you might be wondering, well, how does this make sense that the larval form uses one plant and the adult form uses other plants? And that's really habitat partitioning or resource partitioning because the larvas and the adults aren't competing for the same foods. So it's another genius adaptation of insects. I have a queen butterfly here, and its larval host plant are milkweeds, similar to monarchs. Oh, here's one. Ah. Got it. I have a checkered white here in my net and its larval host plant are from the mustard family. Let's release it. Hey, Bob. Hey. I need help catching a xylocopa. I can't find one. All right, well, let's go do it. Okay. That one. Hey, Bob, I just caught something. What? It looks Whoa. like a bee, but it's not a bee. Look at that. It looks like a fly of some kind. It's a, I think it's a bee mimic. I think it's mimicking xylocopa. Maybe we can get a good image of it and take it back to the lab and identify it. I'm down. All right, do you have a jar? Yeah. Nice and easy. Here we go. There we go. So the difference between a fly and a bee, all bees have four wings. Flies have two, hence the name of the order, Diptera, two wings. I caught the xylocopa. Okay, we finally caught our xylocopa, or carpenter bees. 
xylocopa means woodcutter in Greek. So hence the name, these bees like to nest in wood. They chew round, large holes about the length of their body to make a nest. So they chew the wood, they don't eat it. They either push out the particles or they'll compact it, kind of like particle wood within their nest. So to ID a carpenter bee or xylocopa, they're really, really large. They're one of the biggest bees. They have very dark wings and their abdomen is naked. So it's lacking those hairs that those bumblebees have that we saw earlier. And then do you remember how the bumblebees have that pollen basket on their hind legs? Well, these bees have a different adaptation. They have something called scopa. So scopa, those are hairs. They're thick, dense bristles that are used to catch pollen grains. So depending on the bee, the bristles will be spaced apart depending on the pollen size. And these bees are generalists. They don't care what kind of bloom, they'll go after anything. Let's let them go. Hey, Will, thank you so much for inviting yeah. us out. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's man. Wonderful. Great to have it's, you all out. It's yeah. awesome. And we've been wondering, what's it, what's it like to live with all these pollinators? <laughs> well, the thing that most people don't know on the lavender farm is this only happens for about one month out of the year. And the rest of the, rest of the year, it's not quite as vibrant. But this month is just, it's, the workload is a lot, but it makes it so pleasurable to just be surrounded by butterflies and bees. And even the sound of the bees, I find, like, just calms my nervous mm. system. I mean, I, you know, I'm already working in lavender fields, but just the bees add to it. It also feels amazing to provide such sustenance for mm. so many and so many pollinators. Mm. It's just an amazing feeling, you know. One time watching you guys out here made me realize I need to just sit down <laughs> and, and just sit with a plant. And I did that. I was watching... Uh, Sarah do that and I just sat with a plant and it's just amazing how many more mm. things you see coming up because right when you walk up to a plant they fly away and then when you just stay like last night I was just standing in the field and slowly they all come back yeah. you know and it's just magical well thanks thanks yeah, again thank you thanks for coming out you, you know. bet hey thanks so much for coming along with us to the lavender farm and uh I tell you what, stay tuned for the next episode of Notes from the Field because we are going to have four more in this series of Unlocking Nature's Hidden Relationships. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do that right now. Thanks a lot. See you later. Let's get out of here. <laughs> next up, California. <laughs>